All right, you can have your seat. We've been in the midst of a series entitled, I Quit. Somebody shout, I quit. Come on, say it like you mean it. Shout, I quit. I'm going to start over so you can find it. We've been in the midst of a series entitled, I Quit. Somebody shout, I quit. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. God has been doing something absolutely incredible through this series, I believe. And I've said it once and I'll say it again. There are certain series that are informative by nature. They are informative by nature or instructive by nature. There are certain series that are uh, restorative. There are certain series that are emotional and cognitive. I believe with all my heart this series was transformative. Uh, that's a word that I'm starting to pick up from my brother. Uh, I said something to him that was disrespectful uh, by default. I didn't realize how seriously he took certain things. I said to my brother, I was like, man, man you're one of the best life coaches I've ever seen. Uh, I, no, I, no, I, that's right, James. I said, man, you're one of the greatest self-help life coaches I've ever seen. He's like, I don't do self-help. He got offended. He's like, I don't do self-help. That's isolated from God. No, I do transformational coaching. Is that right, Darius? Transformational. And when he said it, it, it blessed my life because from the outward, outside looking in, I thought, well, it's kind of self-help or just helping people get better. He said, no, self-help is often isolated from God. Five ways to be better outside of biblical grounding. He says, no, I'm not trying to make you better. I'm trying to make you, make you stronger and transform you. Watch this. From who you are to who God designed you to be. Somebody say, transform me. Transform me. And I believe this series by nature is transformative. It is transformative. Uh, prior to this, I quit series. And I believe many of us lived the life that understood that quitting for many of us was demonized when it should have been weaponized. We were told that to quit means you're a failure. We were told to quit. Uh, I'm going to say it, and I want you to finish it. Quitters never win, and winners never quit. But I believe our working definition takes us to another level because our working definition states to intentionally do less so that God can do more. Now, who's finding that to be true in your life? Throw hands up in the comment, hands in the room. Right now, Pastor Mike, I'm doing less because I'm trying to allow God to do more. This is not a permission slip to be lazy. I had somebody tell me yesterday, I'm not going to work tomorrow. I'm doing less so God can do more. I'm going to pay less of these bills so God can pay more of these bills. No, it is not a license to be lazy. It is a clarion call to lean and depend on God. Put this in your notes real quickly. Put this in the comments. Leaning versus lazy. Leaning versus lazy. Leaning versus lazy. I believe to lean is to be busy because while you're leaning, you're having to defend. Make that make sense, PMJ. Lean not on your... Oh, if you're in the room, you got to help me teach today. Lean not on your own understanding, okay? So let's do this by default. I need your help preaching this. Somebody real quickly, throw your hand up and I want you to speak very clear. Define understanding. Anybody wants to take a... Yes, Roy. Knowing. Anybody else want to take it? Darius. To stand, to stand under. I like how you play it on words. To, to stand under. Clarity. Clarity. So let's take these three definitions. Lean not on your own. All right. Lean not on your own knowing. Lean not on your own clarity. Let's take Pastor Darius' definition. Lean not on what you stand under. Okay. So to stand under means I'm submitted. So if then I am submitted to a way of doing things, to lean on God is to be rebellious to who I am naturally. I don't think you heard what I just said. So hear me when I say this, to lean not on my own will means I am fighting because if I'm leaning, oh, I hope y'all catch this, to lean means I'm depending, but if I'm not leaning on my own knowing, that means who I am naturally is pulling. I'm in the wrong church already. So as you lean on God, you are pulling you. Okay, I'm going to say this. Leaning on God is praying when the old you pulling you to cuss somebody out. Leaning on God is staying faithful when the old you is trying to pull you in a different direction. So what am I learning right now that to quit is telling God I am not being lazy. I am leaning and many of us are activating laziness because we're under the ideology that God will do it all. 
Turn it over to Jesus, and he'll work it out. He's going to work out what you've already worked out. Make that make sense, PMJ. God can fix it. I believe he desires for you to prep it. Okay? All right, I'm going to say it again. I believe God can fix it. I believe there are instances where he desires that you prep it. All right, all my cooks give me a what, 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 what. All my cooks give me a what, what. If you pull a turkey fresh out the store and just throw it in the oven, will it cook? It'll cook. The question ain't, will it cook? The question is, what will it taste like? This is why victory for many of you hasn't been enough. Because God worked the outcome, you didn't prep it before it started. So victory wasn't as sweet as you thought it would be. Because God had to do it all. Oh, my God. And what if God hasn't started the right things in your life because you won't stop doing the wrong things in your life? Quit. Somebody shout, I quit. So far, we quit excuses. We quit complaining. We quit comparing. We quit lying. We quit offense. We quit blaming. And so many people of God find themselves, and please put this in your notes, in a perpetual cycle of dissatisfaction. So many people find themselves in a perpetual cycle of dissatisfaction. And because they can't properly discern what the problem is, we've all made statements like, here it is. I'm not sure what the problem is. I just feel empty. Who's ever made that statement? I'm not sure what it is. I just kind of feel empty. It's because so many of us find ourselves in a perpetual cycle of dissatisfaction. When perpetual is always happening, cycle circles of dissatisfaction. This confession concerns me as a pastor considerably since those who most often feel this way are often the most faithful. Ms. Yolanda, that's what bothers me the most about this feeling of perpetual dissatisfaction is because most of us who find ourselves in this cycle of feeling empty are oftentimes the most faithful. I'm going to say this and you don't have to say amen because you don't want your neighbor in your business. It's like the most loyal people get betrayed. It's like the most given folk get taken for granted. The most loving people are the ones who people choose to lose it on. And we get stuck in this perpetual cycle of dissatisfaction. We make statements like, well, I just feel I'm going through the motions. I'm doing church work, going through the motions, helping people, going through the motions, attending worship, but not energized like I used to be, going through the motions, tired of doing stuff. And honestly, many of us are living, please write this, a lifeless religion. Oh, yeah, we here now. We here now. That's why we let praise and worship be live today. And we let you never let me down all the way. Make sure you stream that. Go pre-order that. For Pastor James is coming out next week. It's going to be incredible. This is why we had Terrell take us to where we used to be. We love to call your name. It's something we cannot explain. The heavens when we proclaim your great name. Your great name. And you got to jump. And went home empty, living a lifeless religion. You mastered participation, not production. You have mastered participation, not production. So you know how to high five a neighbor, you know how to jump, you know lyrics, you know worship, but when you get home, you can't pull on any of it. It's because you have a lifeless religion. You don't have to say amen to me. That's why you started out strong and now you're fading. You used to watch on Sundays, now you watch on Tuesday. You used to, you used to set your whole apartment, your whole house. You used to be set up at a certain time that now church getting ready to come on. I need my kids in a certain place. Now you're on your phone, you're texting. It's because you've, you've given in to anesthetizing conformity anesthetizing conformity anesthetizing that's the root word of anesthesia what does anesthesia do it puts you to sleep how slowly 
Yeah, so when I, when I had surgery, when I had surgery, the, the anesthesiologist, the anesthesiologist walked into the room. He says, okay, we're going to go ahead and start the process. And he put something in my IV. He put something in my IV, but I was still cool. I didn't realize that what he put in my IV was activated in the operating room. You missed what I just said. Once they put the mask over my nose, that's when it activated what was ever happening in my IV. See, anesthesia is so cold because what you went to sleep over ain't what actually caused you to go to sleep. Michael, it wasn't just the oxygen or whatever they put in the mask when they tell you to count backwards. It was also combined with what they gave you in the room. So watch this. You're not asleep because of this. You are sleeping complacent because of this and that. And many of us get stuck in a cycle because we fight this, but we don't kill that. And because we fight this and don't kill that, when something else jumps off that looks like this, it reactivates your... You sleep. So you broke up with the ex, but didn't kill the feeling, which is why the new person put you in the same coma. You left the place, but didn't deal with the feeling or the emotional ties or the spiritual sickness, which is why whenever it combines with something, it puts you to sleep. Yeah. Michael, and the reason you can't get up out that grave is because you got a lifeless religion. Yeah. This is why you always need a prayer partner. This is why you always need somebody to vent to. This is why you always need somebody to hold your hand. And I want to speak by faith, and I want to say this, and I pray seven people who need it can receive it. Lord, restore my zeal for God. Reignite my passion for God's work and renew my strength to be faithful for you. Somebody ought to shout, I receive that. Please put that in your notes if you're watching, if you're listening. I'm going to say it slowly. Number one, restore my zeal. Maybe if I be honest, you will be honest. I haven't been as passionate as I used to be. Who feels better now? It's because life has slowly put us to sleep. TV on demand. Movies on demand. Food on demand. God on demand. This is why I'm fighting so hard now to set us up to get back in church because I'm quickly realizing that, yes, technology took our message across the world and thousands of people have been saved, but the devil is sneaky. Ooh, he cold. You got to get a devil his prop sometime. That boy sneaky. He cold. What'd he do? What he do is let us come online and let us reach millions. But he was secretly taking Sabbath. So although we air it on Sunday, he's secretly putting you to sleep, making you realize you can watch it whenever. So now you have a lifeless religion because the day that used to be your Sabbath alternates. I'm talking heavy today. I'm talking heavy today. And this is why I need to say, go back, Leslie, I need God to restore my zeal. Somebody define zeal. Shout it out. What's zeal? Passion. Restore my passion. I want passion back, Rod. Oh, I want passion back. I want that fire. I want to be the one who lights other people on fire. That's called passion. Hang around me long enough, you're going to get passionate. I want you on fire, Charity. I want you to become all that God called you to be. Reignite my passion for God's work. Don't just restore my zeal for God because it's one thing to have passion for God but lack passion for God's work. That's why so many, that's why so many relationships are just in a weird place because you love the person, you just don't act like doing the work that comes with the person. <laughs> See, so what happens is, no, it's not that I don't love you. I love you, but what it takes to be with you, I just don't have a passion for that no more. Yeah. So the work is draining your passion. I done started too heavy today, ain't it? No, so I need the passion for God's work. No. 
as we get ready to jump into this new series we're doing this year at the end of the year entitled Grateful. And we begin to um, help these people for the holidays. And we begin to visit homes and do for people and help. And we get acclimated to serving again as a big group. I need to make sure everybody's passion for God's work is where it needs to be. Yeah, renew my strength to be faithful. Now, here's what's crazy. I need you to catch this. Over 90% of us, watch this, over 90% of us have a major regret in our lives. In fact, according to the study conducted by professors at Carnegie Mellon University, regret is the second most frequently experienced emotion only after love. Most of us carry some sort of regret. At some point, we reflected over our past responses, reactions, and replies only to arrive at regret. Do I need to say that again? At some point, do I need to say it again, church? At some point, we reflected over our past responses, reactions, and replies. Here it is. At some point, we reflected on our past responses, reactions and replies and arrived at regret when scholars have determined that 90 percent of the emotions 90 percent of people experience the emotion right after love called regret so pastor mike then what is regret please put this in your notes regret is the gap between our choices and our convictions Oh, I wish I wasn't live so Drake can flip that definition because I need to add something else to it. Okay, I, I know you see that on the screen. I want to take your notes to another level. Regret is the gap between our choices and our convictions and consequences. That's heavy, Pastor Mike. Why? After teaching I blame the importance of responsibility, I thought it would be beneficial to warn you about the danger of regret. Regret is a negative emotion that occurs when a person believes his or her past actions or behaviors, if changed, may have achieved a better outcome. You regret when you feel, like watch this, had I done this differently, this would be better. Oh, my God. <laughs> you regret. Also, I want to take this so much deeper than how we look at it. We're going to be a thinking church. Not only when I say, had I done this different, I'm going to step on three, three toes right here. You also regret when you did nothing and look back and think, had I done something? Because you just don't regret what you did. Some of us regret what we didn't do. Am I preaching to anybody today? Oh, my God. Had I said something? Oh, my God. Man, I can't believe I let six weeks pass and didn't do blank. Or, man, I wish I can get back what I said. I'm talking heavy today. If we don't practice responsibility responsibly, it can mutate to regret. Did you hear what I just said? If we don't practice responsibility responsibly, it can mutate to regret. The lack of being responsible for your own actions and decisions birth regret. Immature responsibility is regret. All right. What, what, what is this? That's my hand. What's this? hand what's on the front side of my hand fingerprints what's on the back side of my hand color so on my hand you have a front side and a back side from the back side you can tell my ethnicity from the front side you tell my identity from the back side you tell my ethnicity from the front side you tell my identity which means in life, there is an identity, which is responsibility, and an ethnicity, which is regret. To every situation, there is a front side. I want you to look at your hand. Look at your hand. Everybody, look at your hand. Look at your hand. Look at your hand. Look at the back of your hand. All right? Look at the front of your hand. Front hand. I I'm sorry. I'm so, I wish I was a better pastor. I wish I was a better pastor. 
I do it to my brother. I'm, I wish I was a better pastor. What did the five fingers say to the face? <laughs> so, I, I couldn't help it. I heard Dave Chappelle in my spirit. I'm sorry. Okay, all right, here we go. So, so look at the front of your hand. Boom. Front of the hand is responsibility. Flip it. Back of the hand is what? Regret. All right, keep your hand out. Keep your hand out. What's the front of the hand? Responsibility. Back of the hand. Regret, okay? Hand down. When I say something, I want you to lift up your hand for what you responded with. The last relationship. Put your hand down. The last check you got, were you responsible or their regrets? The last argument you were in, were you responsible about your part in it or are there some regrets? Some of y'all in here looking like Beyonce. I was, well, technically, I was responsible because I said I was sorry, but they thought I was weak. So then, I had to tell them about themselves. Well, technically, I paid my phone bill, but I spent my rent on my clothes. Just look at your neighbor and just do this right here. Just say, hey. Because to every situation, there is a front side and a So can I ask you a question? We love teaching here at this church. We love teaching here at this church in a way that brings the word of God to life. I love having triggers. So if you want to know the secret sauce of my teaching, I try to teach in such an uh, 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 illustrative way like Jesus, who is an illustrative theologian. I try to pre preach in such an illustrative way that if you hear a song on the radio, it triggers what I spoke. So the next time you're driving and somebody cuts you off and you see your hand, always notice that whenever you drive, we never see your responsibility. Nobody in the room drives like this. You drive with responsibility and control. Don't nobody drive with regret. Everybody drives holding on to responsibility. And what if I told you that many of us are stuck externally? Because we stopped internally. Wow. Regret is the gap between our choices and our convictions and consequences. I want to say this in a very real way. I have some regrets. I'm not fully healed from some of my regrets. Not fully healed from some of my regrets. That's why I love Paul, because Paul is one of those teachers who says, forgetting those things which are behind me. That's our scripture today, and I'll get to it. I press toward. I press toward. Paul is saying, hey, I have not yet attained this. You know, I ain't got it all together, so I'm trying to watch this. As I teach you, I'm teaching me. I got some regrets. Oh, my Lord, I got some regrets. When I look back over my life and certain moves, I wish I could get back. I'm going to say this only. I need seven folk to just put fire signs in the comments. It's some money. I wish I could get back, Jesus. Oh, my Lord. It's some things that I wish I could get back. Why, Pastor Mike? Because regret is subtle. Regret is subtle. And regret causes, watch this, complacency. Now, I want to say this. What if I told you that many of us are stuck externally because we stopped internally? So can I ask you a question? What made you stop? What made you stop? What did you regret so much? Regret is so cold-blooded. Now, let me say this, and I, I want to make sure I bring, bring clarity to it. There's a difference between, because even God experienced a form of regret. Now, the definition that God experienced of regret biblically was to sigh. It wasn't, I made a mistake. It was a sigh. That's a beautiful Hebrew word. New Testament written in Greek. Uh, Old Testament written in Hebrew. The definition that God experienced, y'all do know when God regretted when the fallen man happened. He said, I, I, I was frustrated I ever made you. That was a form of regret. But he didn't regret like I made a mistake. That, that definition is too sigh. He said, he felt it. It was a sigh. There's a difference between what we call human regret that's often shrouded in this idea of mistakes. Regret is so powerful 
that it was the tool that God used for Pharaoh to chase the children of Israel. God said, God said, I got to find a way to make him leave because I got to kill him. Because if I don't kill Pharaoh and his army, the children of Israel will spend, their re will spend the rest of their life on the run. God said, if I don't kill Pharaoh and his army, the children of Israel will spend the rest of their life on the run. So I need to use a tool powerful enough to make them think it's their idea. Because I can't give evil a word. They're not spiritually sensitive enough to hear my voice and go get them. So what does God do? He puts something in their heart that made them regret setting them free. So then Pharaoh chases Moses and the children of Israel. Regret will have you chasing people God told you to loose. Regret will have you blaming yourself for a relationship that was not your fault. Regret will have you being faithful to a lie. Regret will have you miserable in the promised land. The children of Israel, watch this, God uses regret to free, to cause uh, Pharaoh to chase the children of Israel. Then the children of Israel, silly self, get out of bondage and regret leaving bondage. They look at the leader and say, man, at least back in what you call it? We at least had food. Watch this. At least we ate on time. Regret will have you remembering the good stuff and blind to the bad stuff. Regret will make you create a false reality. Regret will have you sitting at home saying stuff like, well, it really wasn't that bad. It was only a couple days. What caused you to stop? Am I helping anybody? Externally, everything seemed okay, but inwardly, a cancer of complacency will eat away at your commitments. I want to talk about the cancer of complacency because the cancer of complacency will eat away at your commitment. This is why for many of us, once you give your life to Christ, you begin regretting your wild season. Not even in a bad way. You miss it. Can I get a what what from seven people? No, now you say stuff like, man, I don't do nothing no more. Ooh, you better be glad. Because in your heart, complacency eats away at your commitment. Pastor Mike, I just haven't been feeling like myself lately. Please put this in your notes. It's hard to be all you when you aren't all you. I want to say that better. It's hard to be all in when you aren't all you. Of course, you're not going to be the best Christian you can be. You can't be all in when you aren't, aren't all you. Regret is slowly eating away at your commitments. Wow. And complacency has attacked most people in one area. Look at the screen right here. Complacency is the inability to have motivation and bring about a result of change, which then prevents us from walking out the fullness of our destiny complacency is the inability to have motivation and bring about a result of change somebody say change change cannot happen in the spirit or the atmosphere of complacency you're not gonna lose weight complacent you're not gonna pray more complacent you're not going to start a business. Complacent. You're not going to give. Complacent. You're not going to live. Complacent. Now notice I said live. Those are two, I'm sorry. Those are two totally definitions. Two totally different definitions. Live, you heard existence. When I said live, I heard thriving. God doesn't just want you to be alive. He wants you living. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundant to the full. And you will never be to the full as long as you complacent. Many of you are like your cars. You are comfortable putting $10 in every two days.
Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You don't, you don't even try to fill the car up. You just say, no, g- give me 15. It's Wednesday? 25 and get me to so-and-so, so-and-so. I ain't got time. I just put some more in later. Why not get four? Who's ever, who's ever had your phone dying and you put it on the charger and got so bored just when it picked it right back up? I'm going to show you how, how sick some of us are. I'm going to show you how sick some of us are. You done designed all your furniture around sockets. So that way you can sit comfortably while your phone charging. You got the world's 70 foot cord sitting right. You will literally sit on a hard floor in a corner just to have your phone. Watch this. Instead of allowing it to rest, you rather work it while it's trying to be charged. Can I free you? This is why many of us never feel full. Never feel full. It's simply because while God's trying to do a work in us, we're still working with us. That's why I was telling my team, I said, if we can get to Thanksgiving, we're going to be all right. Everybody exhausted. Everybody brain tired. Everybody frustrated. I'm talking, we killing it. Everybody's exhausted, tired. I'm saying, I know y'all tired. Just give me to Thanksgiving. Give me the Thanksgiving. I'm going to figure, if y'all give me the Thanksgiving, I give everybody a break. Then I'll shut it down. We'll do so, 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 so. And I'm realizing now why, Pastor Mike, if we don't start dealing with complacency, all right, complacency. All right, do do me a favor. Put the definition of complacency back on the screen because I want to slow walk this, okay? Complacency is the inability to have motivation to bring about the result of change. Okay, okay, so I want to free you. I want to free you, all right? Where I am is where you are, all right? If you can zoom out just a little, Dre, that table is where God desires you to be, all right? Over here is where you come from. Did you catch that? So here's where you are, present. That's your future. That's your past. Complacency is the inability to have motivation to go. Complacency determines which direction you look. Motivation moves you forward. Complacency moves you backwards. Now, I'm, I'm, I want to say that better. I want to say that better. Motivation faces you forward. Now you can pursue it. Complacency faces you backwards. And because you're comfortable, regret pulls you back. See, see, complacency puts you in a place where you're idle, and whenever you're idle, an idle mind. So now that you're idle, all you have time to do, watch this. I'm not doing anything, really. I'm in a cycle. Remember, I'm I preaching loop. The first thing I told you about was the perpetual cycle of what? Dissatisfaction. So the per- per- perpetual cycle of dissatisfaction is this. How did I end up in this? Complacency. Complacency has me waking up and just doing the same stuff. I ain't saying go do something new for the sake of doing nothing new. I'm saying same stuff spiritually. Because you can go out all day and come home and still be miserable. No, I'm saying your prayer life is just boring. Your devotion time is just boring. Spiritually. And, And what you then do is blame. I quit blaming. Maybe I need another church because my churches don't motivate me like I used to. Six months later in your new church, you're still going to be in that same cycle. Six months later. What you did, so what you then do now is your spirit is craving word, but complacency is being fed. And because you never quit, the, you quit blaming. You now seek out words that affirm that it's not your fault. And what I'm trying to get you to realize more than anything, YPMJ, it's my job as your pastor to challenge you. That's what I'm here to do. I am here to challenge you. My pastor is my man of God. And I know, Pastor Mike, why would you have to say that? Because if we're not careful, the culture is going to make you think those are two totally different individuals. 
Yeah. So my pastor then is my man of God. And my man of God's responsibility is to push and challenge me to godly living through kingdom principles. My pastor's job is to comfort me when I'm afflicted and afflict me when I'm comfortable. Jesus. My pastor's job is to comfort me when I'm wounded, then wound me when I won't get uncomfortable. Jesus, I'm teaching better than you responding today. What do I want you to realize, Pastor Mike? I have a word for you. Many of us need to quit. Somebody shout regret. One of the greatest faith killers is regret. And if we don't deal with our issues, our issues will continue to deal with us. Overcoming regret is about learning how to forgive yourself. Overcoming regret is about learning how to forgive yourself. For some of us, God is trying to introduce us to a new season. But you're struggling to embrace the new season because of old mistakes. For some of us, God is trying to introduce us to a new season, but we are struggling with this new season because of old mistakes. Something in your, God is calling you to be a king, but you're still tripping on Bathsheba. God is calling you to be Paul and you still remembering the mistakes of Saul. What the devil does is he uses regret to pull on the, rev the crevices of your memory. I'm going to say it again. What the devil does is use his regret to pull on the dark recesses of your memory that you try to forget because it was tied to a season of pain and irresponsibility. So the moment he sees God ordaining you for who you are about to become, he pulls on regret, which makes you remember who you used to be. And if he can get you to dwell on who you used to be, you'll never walk in who he's trying to make you become. It's called regret. So what he does is he makes you feel, uh, put, this, put this in your notes, put this in your notes, put this in your notes. He'll give you survivor's remorse. survivor's remorse <laughs> he'll make you feel bad for actually surviving Yee. so now you go back and try to make happen for everybody who was with you what happened for you when the favor different now you trying to give everybody who didn't make it out your experience and you'll never be able to give them your experience because you ain't their God Oh, my God, which is why I don't care how bad you want it for them. It may not happen for them because the favors are different. It's called survivor's remorse. Now you're tripping. And, and because we learned this in our focus group and we're dealing with this in Healing Academy, when you have trauma bonds, trauma bonds. See, trauma bonds to me are so much deeper than soul ties to me because I really believe sometimes that when it comes to these soul ties, we can deal with these soul ties spiritually. To me, in my personal life, my trauma bonds are bigger than my soul ties. Why, Pastor Mike? Because when it comes to my soul ties that are more so spiritual, I feel spiritually uh, mature enough to deal with the, the spiritual places of my life. But trauma bonds are deeper because most of them are physical to me. I'm finna, uh, oh, oh my God. Uh, can, can, uh, I, I wish I could teach it like I feel it. See, 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 see what, what the devil does is as God is trying to promote you, the devil has a remote. So, so I wish I could preach it like I see it in my head. So as God promotes, the devil uses his remote. So, so, so as God takes you up, the devil grabs his remote and presses rewind. And while he's pressing, so while you're on your way up, the devil is showing you pictures of what you were. So when you get to the door, all you got to do is walk in it. But you spend six months looking at the door, thinking about the... I'm preaching today. And I want to submit to many of you, you cannot reap and regret at the same time. It's harvest time. I almost took out running right there. It's harvest time. 
Right? Faithful, it's, it's harvest time. It's harvest time. But I want to tell you right now, if you don't deal with the regret in your heart, you can't reap and regret. Okay, 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 okay. God bless you. God bless you. Harvest, boom, regret, you can have it. Harvest, boom, regret, you can have it. Harvest. So, so for many of you, whether you know it or not, you playing hot potato with your destiny. Because God's saying, it's your time. Then you say, but it's their turn. God says, it's your time. You say, but it's their turn. God says, it's your time. You say, but it's their turn. Because time and turn ain't the same thing. See, a lot of my haters are mad because they say, I took somebody's turn. I don't determine time. See, turn is selected by man. Time is ordained by God. See, turn denotes that there's a line. Time denotes he breaks time. And what's happening right now is those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. That's what Psalms 126 and 5 says. Those who have sown in tears, tears can be a form of joy, but also can be a form of regret, emotion, are going to reap with songs of joy. But you can't reap and regret at the same time. Regret, I hope you can handle this, put this in your notes, is emotional constipation. Yeah, regret is emotional constipation. Yeah, Paul teaches us in our text today how to win over regret. And many of us are dealing with relational regret, financial regret, moral regret, career regret. And I want to submit to you, never let regret become a prison that leads to no recovery. Never let regret become a prison that leads to no recovery. Paul wants us to know that if you've ever asked, wrestled with regret, you're not by yourself. He's sharing his past accomplishments and how it means nothing in comparison to his new goals. That's rich right there. He's sharing everything he's done and how it means nothing in comparison to his new goals. To know him. It's critical to know Christ intimately, to experience his power, but he has not yet attained it. This is why he says in Philippians 3.12, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. That's critical. Why is that critical, Pastor Mike? Because I want you to realize he says, I know God. I've done a lot of good things for God. I, I, I've been one of the greatest Christians to ever walk the face of the earth. And I still don't have it together. That's what some scholars call progressive sanctification. Progressive sanctification means I am progressing in being sanctified. I'm not who I used to be. And I'm not who I need to be. But I'm a whole lot better than how I used to be. I am progressing. And why is this important, PMJ? In other words, I'm teaching you about how to get to a place that I'm on my way to. Be careful when every sermon you hear is about where a person is, not where they're going. Hear me. You want to know why I thank God? Because as your pastor, I thank God God has me in a season where I'm young enough to where a lot of you are older than me or my age. And, but I'm also at a cool enough age so with my young, young people, I still seem kind of young. So I'm kind of in that fly, smooth, not too old, not too young, couple grades, not a lot of grades. Kind of, you know, you know what I'm talking about, that good age. I'm at that good age, you know, good age where got enough kids, but not too many. What, what, got too many kids. But you get, you get what I'm saying, kind of at that cool age. See, God has me in a season where I am not your travel agent I'm your tour guide I am not booking you flights I'm going in the wilderness with you I'm able to say hey y'all here's something I dealt with this week called regret let's learn about it so as I heal me I want God to heal you you are a selfish leader who has to come out then bring people out sometimes you got to grab hands with your leader and say hey we all coming out together. He says, but one thing I do. Help me, Holy Ghost. But one thing I do. Look what he says in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. Many times we become stuck 
because we're focusing on what we don't have. I'll never be the mother I need to be because I don't have the money to buy the J's. What? I'll never be the husband I want to be because I can't put them in this fancy car. I'll never be the musician I want to be because I haven't had a number one. I'll never be a billion. Hear me. You are so busy focusing on what you don't have. You are missing what God wants you to have. Hear me when I say this. This is why when the pandemic hit and I had to preach to five people, nothing about me changed because I started with an empty room. So where most people struggle, because I'm telling you, I got to get all my people back in the room. It never fazed me because I remembered the nothing. Which didn't change me when I got something, which when it took me back to nothing, I was able to remain who I was because I remembered who God called me to be before I had anything. Am I preaching to anybody? And somebody in this room, God desires for you to be more, but you stuck. Stuck. You'd rather complain to your girlfriends about your marriage and complain about how miserable you are when it was your decision. You forced a person to make a decision they didn't want to make. Now you're mad about the results of the decision they didn't even want to be a part of. I'm stepping on toes today. You beg God, God, if you give me this house. Ooh, my, 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 my. Pastor, I got to sow a seed. No, we, I, I, I found it. This it. This it. I found it. I found it. I found it. Now you're regretting it. Can I ask you a question, a real question that nobody's ever going to ask you? But because I'm your pastor, I want to challenge you. What if God ain't gave you what you prayed for? Because you've proven you're going to regret it. <laughs> I drove six hours to Shreveport. Six hours back, all of us. Two trucks. We, we on the freeway the other day. So six hours for, there. Performed. All right, perform. Hear me. What, 150 people, 175 people, 170? So we drive six hours, whoosh, Shreveport, 175 people. I want you to think it was stadiums. 175 people, right, for free. because it's, it's, You got to know my heart when I feel God calling me to assignments. Okay, so six hours, whoosh, 175 people. We pour our hearts out. Hear me, boom, lay down, wake up at 5 a.m., six hours, whoosh. Hear me when I say this. He's where he's supposed to be. They're where they're supposed to be. I'm where I'm supposed to be. There are going to be moments when he calls and say, Pastor, I'm, I'm exhausted. I ain't got nothing left. That's called being human. But to just sit at home and be like, man, I'm trying. I had to do so-and-so. Oh, your excuse that you wouldn't quit has birthed now blame, which you won't quit, which has mutated now into regret. Because a lot of your excuses aren't nothing but mass regrets. Well, I can't do that because I got to do so-and-so. So, you know, I got all these kids. And if you ain't careful, what your mouth said was, I got all these kids. What your heart said was, I could have did it, but you know, if I ain't have all these. When it's somebody who wished they could have one. It's quiet in Zion today. It's quiet. I bet them numbers so low on the stream today. I bet it is. Because everybody want to hear about rejoice. Don't nobody want to deal with regret. And praise ain't going to fix your problems. I don't care what nobody tell you. You can come to church and shout all Sunday. That same bill going to be there when you get back. You can shout all you want. Yes, God can do it. But the truth of the matter is many of us have become lazy, not leaning. And because we become lazy, we're expecting God to fix everything when God wants you to participate in your transformation. If the butterfly, if the worm does not build the cocoon, it doesn't transform. The transformation happens in the cocoon. But if the worm doesn't put in the work and build it, it don't happen. And many of y'all are worms who are blaming God because you don't have wings. When God is looking back at you saying, build some. Yeah. Michael, build some. When they got transformed, they built the cocoon. Yeah. 
they built a cocoon. And if you don't get over a spirit of comparison, if you don't get over a spirit of excuses, if you don't stop blaming and you don't get through regret, you will continue a cycle. He See, here's what most of our lives look like because we don't quit. Well, how, how, how they flying? They built a cocoon. Then all of a sudden, well, you want me to go all the way up there and build a cocoon? You know how long it's going to take me to build a cocoon? And the whole while you fussing about the cocoon, somebody else had already built they cocoon. So now you're looking at them like so-and-so don't come around no more. They in the cocoon. Now we ain't, we ain't as close as we used to be because see, you used to be down here with me all the time. See, there will be people who hate you for building something. They in the cocoon. Then all of a sudden, you finally must up enough courage. Well, let me go and build my cocoon. Then once you build a cocoon, you mean I got to keep going through this? I don't even see nothing. Uh, uh, uh. Then once you come out the cocoon, then you look and say, why are they wings so much bigger? I wish I would have had a little more color. Because if you don't quit comparison, excuses, blaming, regret, whatever God do for you will never be enough. Jesus rose up on Lazarus. His sister looked at him and said, if you had been here, blame. He dead because it's your fault. Lazarus dead because you was late. Do you see? It's in the Bible if you dig. Lazarus is dead because you late. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Then Jesus weeps. Jesus weeps because he's dealing with maybe regret. How they still don't believe. Some scholars say he's crying because his friend died. Some scholars say he's crying because all the miracle he's done and his relationship with um, Lazarus and his sisters, they still didn't see him for who he was. I don't know. It's, it's conjecture at, bo at best. But what do I see? Whatever that confrontation was brought about an emotion that many of us wrestle with. Which is why I love the song James wrote when that line he says, the language of my tears. Watch this. Because tears talk. Paul says, I've been through a lot. But one thing I do. Forgetting what is behind and straining forward what's ahead of me. I want you to remember so you don't repeat. I'm going to stop. I've been too heavy today. I want you to remember so you don't repeat. When he says forgetting, he's referring to him letting it go so that it can let him go. Forgetting what lies behind. All right. Can you put this in your notes for your pastor? Strain your memories. Strain them. Because if you forget everything, you'll lose faith. <laughs> Paul says, forgetting what lies behind, I press toward. In other words, I'm forgetting the pain and the problems, but I'm remembering the miracle. Oh, I, I got to make that succinctly come together. Okay, syntax. Paul, Paul says... Strain the mess, hold on to the miracle. Strain it. Strain it. You ever been cooking, boiling some noodles, and that pot was super heavy? Then once you strained it, it became light? Because the noodles didn't have the weight. The water did. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> once you were done with the water, what did you do with it? Discard it. Many of you are still heavy because you're holding on to what you should have discarded. <laughs> it's regret. What if I told you to every parent, you are a great parent. Children make bad choices. I love my boys. I love my daughter. I feel like I'm world's best daddy. We were on the road all day yesterday. I got home, took my kids straight to the bowling alley. We played, hung out with the boys, played the game. Hear me. By the time we got settled, it's probably 11.45 at night. My brother and I texting like, bro, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. I ain't have nothing left. Nothing left. I'm looking at the computer screen, typing. 
looking, I see him, and he sent me. I'm like, bro, I'm, I ain't got nothing left. I'm just trying. I woke up on the couch with shoes on. You know how sleepy you got to be to go to sleep with your shoes on? You know, we'll wake up and at least take your shoes off. Shoes on. And if my boys grow up and make bad decisions, I'm parenting with no regrets. Watch this. I'm going to say this and 10 people going to receive this. I'm not going to be a part of their testimony. No, no, no. There's a story that I heard my dad teach. He said two twins were born to a prostitute, drug addict. She lost her mind and died. 20 years later, one became a CEO. The other became an addict. They interviewed the addict and said, why did you become a drug addict? He said, because my mama was an addict. They interviewed the CEO and said, why did you become a drug addict? He said, why did you become a CEO? He said, because my mama was an addict. One used the pain as motivation. The other one used it as regret. And because he used it as regret, it gave him license to become what he didn't even like. Can I ask you a question? What you going to do with your story? Father in the name, I got more, but I'm going to pray. Father in the name of Jesus. Give us the strength to let it go. God, I ask in this moment that the pain that many of us experience of feeling as if we could have done more or we should have done less, it will no longer become a prison to who you're calling us to be. God, even as we look back over the last 24 months, being quarantined and isolated with our own thoughts. A lot of us have now picked up regret that we didn't even know we had. Sitting in rooms thinking about who didn't show it. Thinking about what I think I heard or thinking about the pain of the realities of our past is causing many of us to become stuck in our present, never attaining our future. So God, in this moment, I ask for the strength to let it go. God, like Paul said in Philippians, I press on toward the goal to the prize, to win the prize, which God has called in me. I want to speak by faith that you're getting ready to do a new thing. Oh, God, you're getting ready to do a new thing. And we come against regret. I pray right now for the person who has to make some hard decisions, that they make these decisions with a sound mind, free from regret. That if they decide to walk away and things don't turn out the way they desire, they will be at peace because it was their decision. But God, I speak by faith that the steps of a good man, good woman, are ordered by God. It's in Jesus' name. Everybody say it. Clap your hands. Jump on your feet. Come on, clap your hands. Y'all stand with me. Did you get anything out that word today? I want to do this, man. Do me a favor. Praise God. Tomorrow is Lady J's birthday, man. So can we praise God for Lady J? Tomorrow is her birthday. Want to say happy birthday to you. Do me a favor. Y'all bless Lady. Send her some. Send her some nail money real quick so she can get the nails I saw on Instagram with the little diamonds around the side. The pointy ones, Aisha. I saw those on Instagram. We love you so much. God bless you. All you mean to not just me, but to everyone. We love you from the bottom of our hearts. If you're watching right now and you do not know Jesus, don't regret. Oh, God. No man knows the day nor the hour. You can be here today, gone tomorrow. I want to change that. You can be here today, gone today. I want you to know that when I close my eyes... I know where I'm going to open them on the other side. I want you to text HOME to 28950 right now. If you're sitting there watching me and something in your spirit had you to think if you were saved, give your life to Christ again. No regret. Somebody say amen. If you're giving today, where are my givers at in the room? Raise your hand in the room. Giver, givers. If you're giving today, I want you to text I rock with the amount you wish to give. The 28950. Yes, there are a couple ways you can give. Text to give or cash app or my members from the West Side who continually mail it in. All my church mothers, I love you so much. I want you to be faithful over your giving. The Bible says, will a man rob God? Where have you robbed me in my tithe and offering? We understand that to not pay tithe isn't to rob God. We, begin, we believe in grace giving, that we don't give because we have to. We, we give because we get to. I want to argue and suggest to you that exchanging get 
and have can change regret. I mean, it's, I don't have to get these kids up. I get to wake my children up. I don't have to go to work. Somebody's unemployed. I get to go to work. And I believe we should have a, a form of gratefulness for all that God has done in our life. I am so, so, so excited. I love you so much. I'm praying that the favor of God and the blessings of God continue to overtake your life. I want to thank every person who's been rocking with us, remaining faithful and staying prayed up. I had a young man on my Instagram the other day send me a post that I shared, had a cuss word in it. He said, uh, he said, I have to always get my beep word of God in. And I sat there and I looked at it for about seven minutes. Then I inboxed him and said, man, I'm so proud of you. And what he said back to me blessed my life. He says, man, you sort of the only person who get me. And he said, man, when I read the word, it takes me to another level. You're bringing the Bible to life. That's who God is calling us to save, to seek and save that which is lost. If we only want to preach to people who got proper English, we are not doing the will of God. He said, go ye. I'm going to say it again. Go ye. I'm going to say it again. Go ye. We don't know what therefore look like. We don't know what all nations look like. Sometimes they may speak differently than us. They may dress differently than us. But I believe if we be the church, God will use us as a tool to resurrect them back to life. So I love you, Rock City. I'm praying for you. Stay connected. Devo Energy has been off the chains. I have heard your cries and your complaints. Pastor Mike, I love Devo Energy, but it's a different level when you come on. It's a different level. I know Roy does his Transformation Tuesdays, but it's a different level. I know Aisha, them always try to go on Thursdays, but it's a different, I know Pastor Hollis has that little backdrop in his office with the microphone. Here's a sneaky uh, behind the scenes uh, uh, undercover. That mic doesn't even work. I put that mic on his desk because I said it'll make your video look a little better. So the truth of the matter is that microphone that he has doesn't even, it's not even plugged up to anything. I'm hating. Y'all, I love y'all so much. So his mic, none of their mics actually even work. I mean, it's on the bottom of my heart. I love Devo Energy. A thousand people every day study the word of God knowing their pastor won't be on it. That's the sign of a strong church that is not built on a personality. It's built on a savior. And that's what I'm excited about. So I love you guys so much. Do me a favor. Go pre-order James Fortune's new single entitled Never Let Me Down. I can't wait till this Friday when it drops. This Thursday at midnight. This Thursday at midnight it drops. I'm so excited. Every hand lifted. Repeat after me. Say, Lord, your will. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. In Jesus' name, I love you. Give God the best hand clap of praise you got right there.